Welcome to this episode of the 9420 Podcast, where we talk about the music that we love and the industry that we tolerate. Welcome to this episode of the 9420 podcast. That was Beautiful Place by Carl Alaco. Hi, Greg and Carl. How are you both doing? Hello, my fellow podcasters. I didn't want that to end. I, I was like, oh, now we got to do the podcast. I was, I was digging it. <laughs> that I was, was um, I told you I've been doing those hallucinogenic psychedelic <laughs> journeys. Yeah. You know? yeah, the journeys, yeah. So the I, journeys. I, I did one a couple of, about a month ago, and I came, and that's, basically my musical interpretation of what I felt that day. I was just like, I'm like doing new age music now. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and the little, what is it called, tabla or something? That, like, I don't know, just a bunch of percussive things I threw in there. That little percussion thing is And like just droning zen, on and yeah. on like. But at the end, I was like, oh, that, this is fine. This can stay right here for about 20 minutes. Well, you that's know? how I felt. Yeah. I was just sitting in the on the porch of this house upstate New York, yeah. looking at the sky yeah. for about, Six hours, <laughs> and and it was it was perfect. It was bizarre. Yeah. So, yeah. anyone who wants to like go into themselves, I recommend the nothingness you know, of it. Yeah, the, right. I recommend psychedelics, man. <laughs> oh. Anyway, here we go. <laughs> but uh, but tonight, well, finally, well, we're doing our what? Finally, one. Not only is it our one hundred and fiftieth episode, mind well, you, ah. but it is also the most anticipated because it is the Dem Beatles episode. There you go, baby. (sighs) It's going to be amazing. It's funny, like, there was no negative. There was nobody said, I hate them, they they were the worst. I'm surprised. (laughs) 
People are going to think we're like just biased and making it all, but no, no one responded with negative. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's I told a, you I'd come up with a few negative things just to balance it out. So. Okay. <laughs> so, but basically the funny thing about this though, now we're getting all historic here. This all started 8 p.m. on February 9th, 1964. Now, yesterday and today, our theater's been jammed with newspapermen and hundreds of photographers from all over the nation, and these veterans agree with me that the city never has witnessed the excitement stirred by these youngsters from Liverpool who call themselves the Beatles. Now, tonight, you're going to twice be entertained by them. Right now, and again in the second half of our show, ladies and gentlemen, the Beatles! Let's And that, uh, and that was it. You know, and, yeah. and, and I think 73 so, million people saw that. And that's how they entered America. And then how it, it's old never stopped. were you both when that happened? I was only about eight. I was four. Okay. So, yeah. You, so, so do you, Greg, do you have any memories of that or not? No, none. Zero. Okay. I had a friend called Gerard Fiorenza. I lived in uh, South Ozone Park. And he had an older sister. I, I want to think her name was Holly. I think she was like 16. I remember the first time I heard the word. Like, so I was riding my bicycle and said, hey, this is new group. And I wasn't into music at all at that point, you know. It was, yeah, it's called The Beatles. I'm thinking The Beatles. Bugs. I thought of Bugs, you know. I, I didn't know, you know what this was. Who wants to sing about Bugs? <laughs> right. I, got, I was sort of stupid. And then, like, um, remember, like, you know, and then she played me this record, Please Please Me, uh, on yeah. Tolly. It wasn't even on Capitol. It was the old Tolly label. And I go, this is cool. And then they were at Sullivan, like, you know, a couple of weeks later, I go, wow. And yeah, it's like, like you know, it's almost a cliche, but so many musicians say it, like, that's when, like, Billy Joel and Sting, and you, you took Eddie Springsteen, when the Beatles hit, they just changed something. It was weird. This speaks to the idea that, you know, we talk about it sometimes, the long tail, which is like, you know, kind of media is so segmented now, whereas... When this came out, you know, there was basically, if you got Ed Sullivan, the whole of America saw you and you got to, you know, they got to decide whether or not you were going to be a rock star or whether or not you were just going to be with the act that was spinning the plates. Ed Sullivan broke Elvis too, you know? Yeah, exactly. The Stones, The Doors, all those bands. Everybody. I mean, it was ubiquitous. There was no discovery to it. If you got booked on that show, it was either we love him or we hate him, you know? And it went quick too, like, you know, because there was no social media. It was just all analog and old school and the Beatles yeah, it's were funny. like, he, they he were mentioned. global. They were global, like within within weeks. It was incredible. Yeah, it, it, it's funny he mentions like the media of the day. The, the newspapers have been buzzing about right, right. You know, these kids from Liverpool. Anyway, we asked a bunch of people, because the big question is why 60 some odd years later, they're still kind of... Still kind of relevant. But right. before we get to that question that we asked these listeners, I would love to know, like, out of all of the songs that the Beatles have created and put out over the last 50 plus years... What are your favorites? That's a that's a ridiculous question. Ooh, why is that a ridiculous <laughs> question? Because 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 it's like for somebody that's a, a a huge fan and it's like formative. Because it's changed for so long. I was a Lennon guy. I thought he was more angsty. And I thought Lennon, but then like later years, I kind of mellowed to McCartney for no one and Revolver and McCartney and here everywhere. Like he was an amazing ballad songwriter. And then you know then Lennon comes out with um, Instant Karma and Cold Turkey and. And then Strawberry Fields as opposed to Penny Lane. Like, it go, and then I love, I love I Want to Hold Your Hand. You know, I love She Loves You, I think, is, is an amazing song, amazing recording. I'll tell you, I just went to, um, I told you guys, I went a couple weeks to Vegas because I wanted to see that love show. I hadn't seen it. It's been around for yeah. a long time. You know, the, the Cirque du Soleil Beatles thing? Right. And Giles Martin had access to the actual master tapes. They remastered it and remixed it and mashed it up. And, like, they mashed up different songs together and, like... I've never heard I Want to Hold Your Hand as good as I heard it at that show. It sounded so sonic and so powerful. That's really interesting because that would you would think for somebody who was an aficionado of all their work, that's a very kind of popular song, you know? I mean, that was a song that people that don't know anything about the Beatles know and would tap their toe to when they heard it on the radio a million times. I remember hearing once, you know, like years ago, I'm driving the car, remember I Miss... You know, yeah, the, sure. DJ. Don Imus. And he said, yeah, and he said, um, here's a song that changed the world. And then he plays, I want to hold your hand. And he's wow. right. It wow. kind of changed yeah. society in so many ways. That was yeah. the 
You know, even more than Elvis. Elvis was maybe the start, but the Beatles really kicked it into gear with the whole counterculture and stuff. I think they were... Well, on- yeah, a whole culture developed behind what the Beatles did. And, and I have a my only, my singular point to be made because I've made a big deal of the idea that I'm, I'm not an expert. I, I know very little about the Beatles other than this amazing body of work. But I do have one opinion that I think uh, holds water when it comes to answering the question, you know, what makes them so legendary? What makes them so iconic? And I think it's because, unlike Elvis, they use their imagination to basically develop a whole new experience listening to a long playing album. That created a whole genre of music. We would not have progressive rock. We wouldn't have rock music if it weren't for the Beatles experimenting with how you listen to an album. My feeling is that I think they were great. They, they were of their time, but I think they were in the age of discovery, and I right, think they just, went, they just went with it. I think it was all just timing, man. Timing was everything. And I yeah, think, and people were experimenting with altering substance, mind-altering Yeah, substance. drugs, man. <laughs> that was it. And, you know, and so I guess that contributed to the idea. I'll, I'll take 30 minutes to listen to this side of this record. You know, I'll take the experience. I'll, I'll take the trip with you, that kind of thing. But, I, but I, I really and truly believe that it created the industry because... You know, you wouldn't have The Who, you wouldn't have Days of Future Past, you wouldn't have these listening experiences that changed people. You wouldn't have Dark Side of the Moon. I'm not sure that's totally true. Um, well, before the Beatles, the albums were just used for symphonic music, they were used for sometimes soundtrack music, and then they were just singles. But, were, then, but, see, but then there are, there are people that will argue, like Brian Wilson released Pet Sounds with Godly Knows, all this cool orchestration, all this cool stuff, cool harmony, yeah, yeah. you know, and he was like kind of panned, and then the Beatles come out a few months later with Pepper, and they're like heralded as like the, these like geniuses, and he's going, what about what I just did? But it could, well, it contributed <laughs> to his... <laughs> It contributed to his mental breakdown. Of course, he goes. Listen, th- I just- that you know he tried to do it contemporaneously with what with the, what they were doing, and they got all the attention. Yeah, I think there's no question. I that. think that, I think Godly knows that song. The way that's orchestrated, it's it's incredible. Yeah, yeah. you know, well, and and like they, they were also doing, they call them song cycles, where the songs on the album are programmed on the album in, in a particular sequence, and that became a thing, and. The imagination is just beyond anything that anybody ever did as a pop singer. You wouldn't find Frank Sinatra sequencing an album so that was a total listening experience. The watershed moment of Sgt. Pepper was, even though I don't think that's their best album by far, but I think what that established was is that's when rock and roll became... It created the art form. Yeah. For something you dance to, to something now you listen to. Exactly. It's like become this whole listening experience with the words in the back that's, and... Yeah, that's my feeling. Yeah, yeah, it was it was pretty incredible. Let's get back to the favorite song thing. So I do have a favorite song. It's it's silly, but I have I do have one favorite Beatles song. Okay, what is it? It's off the White Album. It's called I don't know for some reason I've always loved Sexy Sadie. I don't think oh, I've wow. ever heard that. That's very interesting. It, it's just this. I don't know because it's kind it's, of a throwaway. It is. Yeah, it's not. It, it's not a big one at all. It's like this one that Lennon wrote about the Maharishi and like. You know, and uh, being in India and a sexy Sadie. I just love the piano. The he played the drums on it. I think it's really yeah, throwaway. But I just, it just touches me for some bizarre reason. What do you think of as a as a person that doesn't identify as a super fan or an expert? What do you think of? Uh, and I think that you are a, a fan and an expert. What do you think of Eleanor Rigby? Great, it's fucking great. Is that your favorite, Greg? Maybe. Uh, I just think it was like so out of its time and it paints so many pictures in the course of what was considered to be at, at the time, you know, kind of a single. But it's a very, very bizarre piece of music. What's cool about them... They didn't rest on their laurels. They just kept changing and trying new stuff and, and weren't afraid to, to just do what they wanted to do. Like, you know, yeah, well, yeah. it's like 1966 when they, you have all this nonsense on the radio and they're doing this quartet cello <laughs> stuff. Talk- yeah, you know, yeah. Like- and, they're, and they're, you know, and like the, the preacher, the pastor, the vicar, 
is like clapping the dirt off of his hands as he walks away from a graveside. Yeah. What? It's the Beatles, man. What? But but they get they, they, and Strawberry Fields and like yeah. I am the Walrus. Come on, like this is great yeah. stuff. It's amazing. You know, and, and, and they were and they were putting this stuff out. Granted, if they came if they started with that stuff, they wouldn't have got anywhere. But because they started with I want to hold your hand and she, and and I feel fine and can't buy me love and all those, they were the Jonas Brothers for the first three years. You know. <laughs> yeah. Yep. 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 And then they just. Then they just like got start getting stoned and they start just doing cool stuff. I don't know. They didn't care. And maybe it is the case that the mass audience went with them on that experience. You know, so maybe right. Maybe Their that's audience a huge with them. factor. That's a huge factor. Yeah, it really did start. I mean, I think it it started a movement that became the next 30 years of rock music in, in America. Unknowingly became like the manual and how to be a rock star. They started with the suits and then they grew their hair long and then they they just did everything first and they got so big at it that they became what you do. You know, even like the U2 played on the roof. You know, everybody wants to play on the roof. Everybody wants to wear their hair long. <laughs> exactly. They just, like, do, just do what the Beatles do. They you know? kind of did it all. So, so here's, a, here's a question for you. So if you go with my premise that this like imagination laden idea where they actually created the listening experience for a long playing album. How much of that concept was George Martin's versus the Beatles? What, what's your opinion? Who knows? I think they were like sponges. I think they were talented. I think they, they met the right people. You know, they were lucky, like, you know, they had they had the Brian Epstein had the right hero to try to sell him. Then they just met the right producer who was like who kind of saw what they had and plus had this all this musical ability himself. He was like a classically trained he knew how to score stuff and he would turn them on to different things. I think he turned them on in the beginning and they were just really like sponges and wanted to learn and they how about try this? Can we try this? And they go, Yeah, yeah. Towards the end, I think they, they were telling him what to do. I think, I, think it, I think he was probably intrigued by the Jonas Brothers making art, you know? I mean, well, he realized that these, these, these weren't just kids who just wanted to, they wanted to do stuff. Like, Lennon wanted to say something. Lennon was moved by Dylan. You know, that, you know, why you, you're writing these songs if you're not saying anything? So he says, you're right. So he started saying stuff, and, he, and, and unbeknownst to him, he, he had that talent to do it. Like, he really knew how to write lyrics. You know, I, I don't know. It was just timing, luck, all of it. It was the time. But let's see what somebody's yeah. doing to say. So let's go to our singular question of the week. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right. So we asked our audience members to throw us an answer on what are your thoughts on the Beatles and why do you think they're still so revered by so many 53 years after they broke up or not? I'm going to play mom. Our friend Scott's the first because he's okay. like he's the most. Yeah. This guy's actually recorded. Scotty. He's actually recorded in Abbey Road Studios. This guy is like so. This would be the definitive answer. I, I love his answer, <laughs> and he's really kind of concise. Let's see what Scott said. The Beatles, yeah. The influence is so all encompassing and pervasive that it's almost impossible to kind of know where to start, you know, musically or culturally. And, of course, those things are intertwined, basically. But, you know, I, I still marvel at just the fact that you had two guys as insanely talented as McCartney and Lennon that lived that close to one another. And then a, a third, a little brother who comes along who learns so much by the end of the run that he arguably beats out the older brothers in the songwriting department. Obviously, it's such a an amazing influence on society in general because here we are 50 to 60 years later still talking about it. And, you know, I know some um, younger musicians in their early 20s that I ask them about various things that we typically call classic rock, you know, be it Led Zeppelin or Pink Floyd or the Rolling Stones. They really don't seem to know much about them, but they know Beatles songs. It's just inescapable. Their parents, their grandparents, and I mean, really, they're even their great-grandparents could have been playing them. You know, on a musical level, anything you need to know about songwriting of almost any popular genre, you can find a Beatle version of it. There's always something to be learned from the songs, even their slightest songs that they're maybe just uh, album tracks. There's always something to learn. 
if you're interested in learning song craft or production craft. You know, so many of the things that we still use today, they exist because the Beatles thought up a need for it and then browbeat the staff at EMI to come up with it. And showed no appreciation for it when they did come up with it. But still, we're using that stuff today. And, you know, now we get it at a push of a button where it you know, might take a whole day just to create one little effect back then. I mean, it's not like they invented everything from scratch. Nothing comes out of a vacuum. But they just seem to grab more things out of the ether than so many other people did at the same time. And I don't know. I think that as long as there is the concept of pop music... I just can't really see them being eclipsed. It had a huge effect on me. I saw them on Ed Sullivan, and like everybody of my generation or slightly older, that did. I mean, it was a life-changing experience that led to at least what I'm doing now and have always done my whole adult life. So, you know, for better or for worse, they brought me to this point and millions of others. So that's kind of the, the testament to their place in the firmament. Seems like they've always been around and probably always will be. There you go, huh? Gosh, I we're, we're done. We're done. <laughs> we're, yeah. we're done. We're, that, that's all we need. He summed it up, right? Yeah, he's he's amazing, Scott Baggett, our friend. He actually produced Carl's record back in the day, and uh, he's a very, very talented yeah. engineer, producer. He's worked with people like Jeffrey Steele, who's a world-class writer. He's worked with Alison Krauss. He's worked with countless artists uh, that are Canadian based for some reason he likes going to Canada and making records but uh, <laughs> Scott's uh, Scott's an amazing guy and let's thank him for contributing I think that was pretty cool and we had some other people um, yeah who, one, who do we who do we want to listen to next let's listen to like now this this is Darian Lee I think she's an artist she is as an artist we've, okay this is what Darian has to say I love the Beatles because it's a group of individuals that were still so individualistic within their group. When you listen to their music, you can still hear each of their personalities and how they blend so perfectly into song. They sang about topics that were really relevant at the time, and those topics are still really relatable even now. As someone who wasn't even alive during the time of the Beatles, I'm 24 and I still feel that so much of their music is so relatable. They're take on pop culture and how they've literally just held it in their hands for so long they're still so loved and i think that the one thing i love about their music the most is that it is so inviting to everyone even though sometimes they're singing about things that were very strong in opinions but they were always so huge on just love which i think is what everybody really at the end of the day wants that's what McCartney always says. Like when it, you know, when it all comes down to it, the majority of what they sang about was love, you know, and yeah. uh, it's true pretty much. You know, you think about it, you know. Yeah, I like her take, and you know, you can tell she's a creative person because uh, the how visual her take is. Mm -hmm. She said they held pop music in their hands, and you can hear the care, right? Right. Very interesting. Well, and I like the fact too. She opened it up with the fact that they were a group, but individually they came together to make this very interesting sound but they kept the individuality alive so yeah i think that's a that's going to be a recurring theme the the idea there's the a funny thing there's a funny meme up on uh, or a clip up on tiktok you see where mick jagger in inducted them into the hall of fame mm -hmm. back in whatever it was <laughs> and he's talking about that when he goes well we were in a, cl in a club we heard about this band from liverpool liverpool and there they were the beatles john paul Dozer ringo John Paul Dozer Ringo. He kept saying, the four-headed monster. John Paul Dozer Ringo. So he says, he kept on saying the four names. Like everyone, they were one of the first bands where you knew every guy in the band. John Paul, yeah, yeah, George, yeah. and Ringo. John Paul, George, yep. and Ringo. <laughs> that's hilarious. Yeah, that's a very, uh, maybe that was a calculated thing. I don't know. but It just uh, worked out. John Paul, George, and Ringo was just funny, yeah, man. Well, in latter years, you know, it was hard. To, aside from the front man, only the people that were completely touched Right. knew who the bass player was or knew who the drummer was, you know? Right. Yeah, so that that was kind of an oddity in the... Your friend Bill Lloyd, let's hear what Bill had to say. You can... Yeah, from Foster and Lloyd. Yeah. Bill Lloyd is, um, he's a Beatle expert if there ever was one. Hey, my name is Bill Lloyd, and I've been asked to give some thoughts on the Beatles. I believe they're the most influential group in the modern pop era. The impact they had 
on the generation of fans that grew up with them became a lasting thing that was passed down to younger generations. And I believe the music was so good, the younger generations loved it too. And I think even 60 years down the line, that's true to this day. I think they were also the blueprint for so many bands that followed, not just in terms of their style or fashion, which was true, but also because they grew into a creative collective. They had multiple vocalists. They had multiple songwriters. No band before them did that, as far as I know, as I can think, as far as I can think of. But the biggest bands that followed them, especially in the seventies, bands like uh, Fleetwood Mac and the Eagles, had multiple singers, multiple songwriters, and their catalogs were all the stronger for that diversity. So I believe them to be the blueprint for all that. There's a jillion more reasons, but that's a short right there. Thanks for listening. You know, he said something that George Martin has said too. I remember reading this years ago, where he goes. So when they auditioned for him, right, initially he goes, well, Paul's a good singer, but John has a good voice, and George sings, and none of them were the lead singer. And like prior to that, every band had a lead singer, one guy. Right, mm-hmm. right, And he right. goes, well, who's going to be the star? And then he goes, you know what? Maybe none of them. Maybe they'll all be the star. And he thought, why not take him as, as, as all of them? So that was like almost like a, an insight that he had for, you know, let him yeah. be three singers. Why not try that? Why not? And it worked. And he's until, right, and, and Bill's until, right. Until, until Bill mentioned that, I had not really thought about it, the idea that that's kind of a rarity, you know, the ability for a band to establish themselves, but there are different people singing different songs right. over the course of the career. And then that uh, happened, and he's right, then Fleetwood so, Mac, and then the yeah. Eagles, yeah, that, that you know, would, Henley and, and Frey. Would yeah. you say, yeah. then, that they are the original boy band? Oh, definitely, <laughs> definitely. I, th- I think they, they would probably cop to that, yeah. Because yeah. without the Beatles, there probably would be no in or Boys Because they were a boy band. If, if you yeah. look back in, the, in those early films, girls were screaming, they were fainting. You know, oh, they yeah, were like, yeah. it was stupid. I can't even understand it. It's mass hysteria. I don't even get it. But It probably has something to do with, you know, the mass audience. But, you know, you didn't see, even as big as they were, with you know, being plugged into the machine, right. the boy bands of the 80s and 90s, uh, you didn't see them stepping out for major motion pictures in distribution you know, worldwide. I mean, the Beatles did that in the first two years of their existence. The first year, I, I, Hard yeah. Days Night and Help came out in a year. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, they were, they were, they they wrote the book. I'll tell you something yeah. funny though. I found this cool clip in October, I think, of '63, before they came to America. They were bubbling up in England. They were on this talk show, and they asked Lennon about. How long do you think? Because rock bands only last maybe a year, you know, whatever, a few months, and the next one, next fad. So this is what Lennon said back in 63 about the Beatles. How long are you going to last? Well, you can't say, you know. You can be big-headed and say, yeah, we're going to last 10 years. But as soon as you've said that, you think, you know, we're lucky if we last three months, you know. (laughs) Three months, yeah. Yeah, 53 years later. (laughs) <laughs> 300 years. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. That's probably where they're going to end up. Well, let's see here with um, another artist, I think, Drew Ryder-Smith. Mm-hmm. See what Drew had to say. I've always had a lot of respect for the Beatles uh, because of their impact and their influence on music from the time that they started making records uh, all the way up to today. They've been a, such a heavy influence uh, for so many artists that I love uh, in in many different genres. And while I had a great amount of respect for the Beatles, I, I'm not sure that I appreciated them the way that I probably should until I watched the Get Back documentary. And that really changed everything for me to see their process and to see just how hard they worked on it. Those guys were never afraid to get outside of their comfort zone. They weren't afraid to push boundaries. And they certainly weren't afraid to do different things Uh, than what their fans had been accustomed to. Things that were different from the records that that made them popular, the record before, two records before that. They they just kind of went for it. And I think because of that, you know, you listen to all the different Beatles records. Revolver sounds so much different than Abbey Road, and Abbey Road sounds so much different than Sgt. Peppers. And So I think there's something for everybody there, and maybe that's why they've had so much influence on so many different genres. Again, another cool insight, because I, I edit this podcast for this woman who does an art podcast for artists, right? And one mm-hmm. of the questions she asked all these artists, 
do you keep your audience in mind when you're painting? And they all say no. They could care less about their audience. They just do right, what they want. Right, right. And I think the Beatles were like that. I don't think they cared about the audience. They just, yeah, that's kind they of just like did what they wanted to do. And then so happened most of the people accepted it, you know. But they weren't yeah. chasing the audience. They weren't chasing the charts, I'll tell you that much, right? No, it's authentic. And it's, um, you know, they, they really, I think it's kind of a marker, like a, like a, a marker in their genome to, to basically, uh, they're, they're following... I don't know. Is it a collective conscious? They're they're following something. They have a message that they need to get out there, and I don't particularly think uh, what they're hearing in the marketplace has anything to do with it, right? If you go to some of those old top twenty charts and you look at the songs on the charts, it'd be like Bobby Vinton, like you know Brazil '66, all, all these like hokey, you know, poppy songs, and then they're doing like you know, it's I like am the post crooner, I, I am the walrus, you know, and like yeah, right, and right, it's right. bizarre. So, so there's we have one more. We have Stephen. Let's see what Stephen had to say. So I kind of like to bring up a different point. So I still think the Beatles are revered 63 years later. However, I think people in my generation, and I'm 26 for context, through Spotify, through when Napster first came on the scene, through Apple Music, through the iPod, I think we've been exposed to different bands from that era that people my age necessarily wouldn't have been exposed to you know, pre those services. So for example, Beach Boys, Psychedelic Furs, even Led Zeppelin. I think there's just a lot more bands available to the everyday listener like myself because of these services. So I, even though I think that the Beatles are still revered, I think that people in my generation aren't holding them up to the same mantle that maybe people 30, 40 years ago might have. And I don't think that's because of the quality of their music. I still think they're you know, an amazing band. I just think there's more to compare to. And I think there was more exposure to other great bands um, like the ones that I mentioned. And the other ones from that era. So I think those are my thoughts. Well, he's right, <laughs> but but he's not. And no, no, I, I, I'll no, tell, I, I agree with I'll you. I'll tell you I why agree. he's right in the yep. sense that because I don't think a lot of people they just see the Beatles in the mix with the Who and everybody else, not realizing though that the mm -hmm. Beatles were there before them all. You know, that's the whole thing. Like you know, he, he's, he's the psychedelic furs. <laughs> they weren't <laughs> the old, they, they weren't the late seventies. They were like that's the old. Uh, yeah, I like the wings. You know. Yeah, yeah. So he like I don't think he realized the Beach Boys <laughs> maybe yeah, but Zeppelin was after the fact. You know, you guys remember like it's all after the yeah. Fact. So th that's the difference. They were here, yeah. but I, I do think before that the Stone, right before the Who. He's right in so much as I, I think there were literally two generations of listeners that missed out on the Beatles catalog because of their inability to negotiate with um, Apple, iTunes. iTunes right, right. Yeah. I mean, because, I mean, quite literally, mm -hmm. that was what, eight or 10 year span that you had to seek out those albums and listen to them on a format other than. The iPod. Because of McCartney, yeah. they were the last to, to release their stuff on compact disc. Yeah. Because he, well, yeah. you know, he wanted more money for it. Cause he, and, and rightfully yeah. so. He figures, why should I get the same royalty rate as Joe Schmo when I'm the Beatles, you know? Exactly. So, exactly. I know. So, but I do think that uh, there were a couple generations, if not three, that missed out on the, the magic of the catalog and, and the ubiquity of the catalog. I mean, like you said, no other pop rock band in existence would be there and would have a catalog had it not been for those two or three years that they strung together after Ed Sullivan. That's my opinion. Two or three years? What are you talking about? That was when they were most active, right? No. They, they were active. They were active for seven years, man. Seven? I'm, I was thinking three. From 64 to 1970 when they released Let It Be and they recorded Abbey Road. I think Rubber Soul, Revolver, Pepper, Magic, Music Tour, White Album were all released in the three-year period from 66 to yes. 68. So That's their halcyon yeah, period, but that I was, think. But they started 64. Yeah. They, they, they released like 13 albums, I think, in a seven-year period. That's, that's pretty insanity. incredible and they're yeah, all kind of great insane. they're all yeah. kind of okay you know even the worst their ones own, are their still own thing yeah, yeah so like you know like you, yeah these bands now together 40 years and they have like six albums <laughs> out and like they're all the sound the same you know i'm sorry no <laughs> exactly. one gets that you know i don't know i do like the idea that they're literally tens of millions of albums available and you know what they did listen. smart too you know i don't think they did it on purpose but 
Unlike the Stones, unlike Dylan, they did like a Marilyn Monroe, James Dean thing. So the Beatles ended in their prime, and their body of work stayed there. They didn't mess with it. You know, we asked this question, I don't know what the answer is. I don't know why they're so revered still. I think they're great. They mean a lot to me. They mean a lot to my youth. Sometimes when I'm like watching some of these um, TikToks, I see like they'll have McCartney, you know, doing like, you know, the end of Abbey Road and in the end, that whole part. And I get teary eyed. Boy, you got to carry that. You know, it's like it brings tears because I, it, cause it touches something in me. Uh. But that's a familiar experience. Right. I, I, I think what's interesting about the Beatles is that if somebody is new to their catalog, and I've had this experience because people that are my contemporaries, you know, uh, they, they're the most important thing that ever happened in their listening life or in their musical life. For me, I didn't listen to the Beatles a lot, so I am still, at my age, 60 years later, I'm still discovering Beatle tracks, right? Right. I, I have not heard everything that they ever produced, and so... Therefore, I get to listen to something that's 60 years old with, with fresh ears and with 63-year-old ears. And so what I think is happening is I think it's not so much that they were ahead of their time. I think it's that they were exactly, perfectly of their time. That's what George Martin says, the Beatles were of their time. Yeah, and so I think when you go back and listen... You, there's this kind of built-in nostalgia. I can g become a fan over and over and over again of certain bands because I know that the work that they did was made with integrity. And that, that's that's kind of the bottom line for me. I think this is our Beatles episode. It's a great place to end it. We've been talking about this for so long, there's no way to make this as good as it <laughs> was in my imagination. But I, I think we did it justice. I thank you to everybody that uh, contributed. Definitely. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the 9420 podcast. Make sure that you listen all the way through to the end because we have one more song by Carl called Old Friend. For everything that we spoke about in this episode, you can go to our website, which is 9420.com. That is the numbers 94 and the letters T-W-E-N-T-Y. Until next time, we'll talk to y'all later. Back when